Uh -huh. And, you know, between flak and between everything else, you really don't think... I was a radio operator, and I had a, we had a, a lever in, on the B-24 that you had to open that lever for the bomb bay doors to open. Uh -huh. Because in case your number three engine got hit and your hydraulics went, then that, that you had enough fluid, hydraulic fluid, so that you can manually lower your landing gear. Otherwise, there's no you, you belly land. So uh, I was sort of, I wasn't it with it. And all of a sudden, the bombardier yells, open bomb bay doors. Now, this is how we're plugged in. Throat mic, headset, oxygen mask, heated suit. And I was on a, I'm a, on a platform where the radio is. And the bombardier says, open Bombay doors. And I didn't, I didn't for the second. And he says, you son of a bitch, open a Bombay. And I jumped down and I disconnected everything. Now, it, you, you last three, uh, three minutes without the oxygen. And it's the greatest feeling, that's the way I want to go. Because you get a high. It's the, oh, you're flying, you're in heaven. It's marvelous. And the engineer, who was not supposed to, spotted me. He jumped down and plugged me in, because if he didn't, I'm dead. And as I'm hanging on to the, the lever, the bomb, opening the bomb, I'm saying to myself, God, if I die, my mother will kill me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we're going to start uh, with me introducing you and then ask you some okay. simple questions to start with, and then you tell your story from okay. when you went in to when you... When came out of service. Uh, this is an interview with Gerald Gersten, uh, Hampton Inn, Terrytown, New York. It is February 5th, 2003, uh, approximately 4.40 p.m. The interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Gerald Gersten, uh, October 25th, 1924, uh, Boston, Mass. Okay. Uh, prior to your military service, what was your educational background? Uh, I had some college at Pace University. Mm -hmm. um, I was in a food business with my father. And I took up marketing and advertising, selling, etc. Okay. Um, where were you? And tell us about your feelings when you heard about Pearl Harbor. I was the why. We were in the gym. We just got finished. Uh, working out, and all of a sudden somebody said, hey, the Japs bombed Pearl Harbor. I said, what's that? We didn't know what Pearl Harbor was. They said, it's somewhere near Hawaii or in Hawaii. And everybody was talking, everybody's, I, didn't, I was just graduating high school. And, um, no, just before, I, I took the pre-cadet physical, no, no I took the pre-cadet course. They had a course, a special course, so that when you do enlist, you go right into pilot training. Mm -hmm. I took the course, and I passed the course, and the, stupid, the most stupid thing of all is, instead of giving you a physical before they give you the course, they gave me the physical after the course, and they found I had a murmur of the heart. And I thought I was going to be, I, I was dead. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was just, uh, in March, oh no, a couple of months later, I get called for the physical, and they checked me out, and at the end of the line is a Marine. And he says, son, how'd you like to join the Marines? I said, I can't. I've got a murmur of the heart. He says, we'll take you. <laughs> I outgrew it. Huh. And uh, the next thing you know, I wound up at Camp Dix, I think it was. And that was March 9th, 19th. Now, did you enlist, or were you... No, I, I, I wanted to enlist, uh -huh. but they told me I had a murmur. The oh, next okay. thing you know, the process took me. Uh -huh. And and in uh, I went in ni March 9th, 1943. I went in, and I went to basic, uh, not to basic, yeah, you know, to first the reception center, and then they they, they issued us uh, um, goose down jackets and all sorts of stuff for winter wear, and they said we're going to Alaska. Oh my God, Alaska! The next thing I get on a plane, I see a guy, Air Force, he's, we're going to fly. We went to Miami. They didn't want the people to know that we were going <laughs> north, because it's going south. And uh, my basic was in Miami Beach. Uh, I forgot the hotel it was. Uh, two letter, two not, 
uh, Ocean Grand, Ocean Grand Hotel. And uh, after basic, I went to Sioux Falls, South Dakota for radio school, where I was a long-term student, thank God. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there I went... Well, why don't you just tell us, because that wasn't on tape, why were you a long-term student there? Because I had the pneumonia. Mm -hmm. I had... Uh, I had two sessions of pneumonia, mm -hmm. and uh, the pneumonia saved me because the other guys all got killed. Where did they go? The, you they went to the 15th Air Force, and they were on that Ploesti deal. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and uh, I wound up after Charleston, South Carolina. And, oh, there was, uh, they always spread rumors that uh, we're getting a furlough, no, here towards the, and nobody had money towards the end of the month. So I, I, I sent the SOS to my parents, and they sent me money, and they thought it was a big joke because we didn't get, we weren't supposed to get furloughs, and sure enough, they gave us furloughs. That was the only one that went. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then uh, I went to um, Virginia. Um, it's the site of. Uh, Oh, it, it's the, the Navy um, secrets. It's the service. Oh, what? Norfolk? The? Not Norfolk. Uh, Newport News? New, uh, Newport, I think it's Newport News. And um, we were crewed up. Mm -hmm. And pilots stand on line, radio operators stand on line, bombardiers stand, and it's just boom, 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 boom. My, I, had, I had two guys from North Carolina. I had one guy from. New York, who was who moved to Texas, who we got rid of, who was the scum of the earth. Uh, we were going to bounce him off up. We were going to throw him off the plane. That's how what a low life he was. He was the kind of guy that claimed that he lost his wallet after he lost a couple of hundred dollars and he didn't have the money. And meanwhile, I found it under his pillow. We had a war. I had a fight. I, it was unbelievable. But when we, after we crewed up, we went to. Uh, Westover Field, Massachusetts, and then we to do some training, and then we wound up, uh, they gave us a plane, it was called the Colossal Fossil. It went, did you name it, or did no, it, was it, it was, already No, it was named? already named. We had, uh, my name, the plane, I named my plane, believe it or not. My pilot was the, probably the shortest pilot in the entire uh, uh, flying, he was about five feet six or seven, he was, his name was Dale Enyart, in fact, I even remember his serial number, 0826909. <laughs> Anyway, Dale, um, it, he was so short that when he got into the plane, you didn't see him. So we called, we called the plane short round. When a, when, a, when a bullet is too short to go through the gun, it's called a short round. So that we had short round. And I, there's one story that I, I really, it's probably an unbelievable story, but it really happened. We were flying on a thousand plane raid to the Henry Ford Truck and Tank Works in Kassel, Germany. Now, Henry Ford was one of Hitler's favorites. He had a picture of him in, in Gestapo headquarters. That was, he was a very, very violent anti-Semite, Henry Ford. And Hitler walked right in his footsteps, and he loved Henry Ford. So when, it was ironic that we were bombing the Henry Ford Truck and Tank Works in Kassel, Germany. And... We were in a thousand plane formation, and all of a sudden, our number three engine starts conking out. That's the most important engine. That's your hydraulics. And we couldn't keep up with the formation, and we're drifting back. And that's what the Germans loved. They waited. They, had, they, they, they would take our planes that were shut down and take the pieces, put them together, and fly into, make them fly and go into the, our formation. And we were told, any time a plane points its nose at you, a fighter plane, open fire, because it's the Germans. And uh, a lot of planes in the beginning were shot down by them. We even, our bombers were rebuilt by the Germans, and they, they would sneak into the formation, and then they'd open fire when the flak and fighters would be coming, and the guys wouldn't really know who was shooting at them. Anyway, uh, as we're coming back, I said, Drill, drop the bombs. We had 5,000 pounds. We had, no, 6,000. We had... Uh, 12 500-pound general all-purpose bombs. And the pilot said, I'll bring them back, which is, and it doesn't count as a mission. It's an abort. It's called an abortion. Mm -hmm. And as we turned back, uh, all of a sudden, the, we go to land, landing 
the landing lights didn't go on. So the, so the engineer is playing around with it, and then it goes on, it goes off. He says, Dale, I don't know what's wrong with the lights. He says, well, we'll try it. And we, and we came in at 120 miles an hour with 6,000 pounds of bombs, and the landing gear collapsed. And the pilot, now, and this was the mission that I, we used to get these chest packs. Now a chest pack would put on your side, and you'd pick the pack up, and if you had it bail out, you plump it. But how many times did the plane blow up, and you couldn't, or the plane, or you're pinned in the plane, and you can't reach for anything? So many a guy got killed because they couldn't get to their packs. I was smart. I put on a backpack. Now the plane crashes, and he pulls it off the runway, and the wings crumple, and gasoline was held in the wings. We flew with gasoline then, and the gasoline, 100 octane gasoline, is pouring all over the place. The bombs, some of them fell in, some of them fell down. You know, we had safety wire on it, but you never know, especially if there's a fire, then that, that isn't going to help you. So I go to get out of the. I forgot my backpack. I couldn't get out. And we don't know where the plane's going to blow, or when it's going to blow, what's going to happen. And my co-pilot was so scared, he got behind me, and they say he had extra adrenaline flowing. When he gave me a goose. I went shooting through that plane. I flew out, hit the wing, bounced off, ripped the chute off, and kept running. And now, here's the strangest thing. I knew that we were all going to be safe, because nobody even got a scratch. Nobody on that whole plane even got a scratch. Can you visualize driving a car 120 miles an hour and having a blowout on your front wheel? I mean, it, it, it's in Congress. But my pilot, and then after, after we come to a full stop and everybody's out, he used to chew on a, 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 a cigar. He never smoked it. He chewed it. In the beginning, he smoked it. But then, we, so he, we're all out there, and, and we're scared because we didn't know. We thought Dale got killed. He comes like nothing happened. He says, everybody all right? And he says, <laughs> on our first mission, they used to give us double shots of scotch, or rye. So... We were all so excited, none of us drank except the pilots. We used to feed him. So uh, this is the strangest thing. My bombardier had in school this guy, his, I forgot what his name was, but his history professor was the interrogating officer. He was, he was a, um, a major. And it was the funniest thing. He looks at him and he, he says, Joe Steinman, what are you doing here? And he says, he says, Professor, what are you? He was, he was debriefing us. So he says, comes to the pilot, and he says to the pilot, he says, what did you see? And he had, my pilot had five double shots of scotch on an empty stomach. And he says, I'll tell you the truth, he says, I can't see a fucking thing. <laughs> and he, we had to take him to his, his room and put him out. <laughs> You know, I tell you, it, 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 when I think of it, I mean, you had to be crazy to, to get involved to do. Uh, one other thing I remember, I mean, this, the flak and all that stuff, that's everybody talks about. But we, we had, one, my last mission was supposed to be the easiest mission of all. You remember the remark in Bridgehead? Okay. So they were going to make a deal. Uh, this was, they were going to split our group and part were going to supply the British and Paul were going to supply the Americans. And we used to, we were to fly low. And, and because it was so tempting, they only allowed us 15 rounds to a gun. They didn't, they took out our ammunition. And we were flying at an altitude, I would say, maybe 100 feet, maybe 50 feet. We were flying under these slag piles. That's like the burnt out coals they used to pile in, in France. They, and to go towards the Morgan Bridgehead. Well, the British didn't get there on time and the Germans kicked the hell out of them and the part of the group that flew to the British got the hell kicked out of them. We lost I think. We sent over 30 planes and I think we lost about six or seven of them and that's a lot. That's 60 guys getting killed. The Germans could throw rocks and hit us. That's how low we This was the market garden where they, they were Capturing the bridge and the tanks yeah, the, were supposed to the get Remagen. to Yeah, the Remagen. Yeah, that was yeah. The, the last bridge in Germany. That was that bridge that... Mm -hmm. And uh, we came, we got, our guys had, had, did it. So when I went to, we went to push out all the supplies. So I grabbed onto one big thing. I thought it was, but what was it? It was the chute. <laughs> and it's pulling me right out of the plane. And luckily, I just had enough to, if my fingers were a little bit shorter, I would have gone right out.
but they, they, then they pulled me in. But, you know, and I said to myself, son of a bitch, this was supposed to be an easy one. <laughs> um, so, uh, when did you get over to England? Uh, we got over to England the end of July. Uh -huh. Did and, you uh, fly over? Or oh, yeah, we took, we took this plane. We went from uh, Manchester, no, let's see, we went to Manchester, New Hampshire, then we went to Goose Bay, Labrador. Then we went to Iceland. And then we went to Stone, England. That's in Wales. Mm -hmm. And then we dumped, we dumped this guy, this creep, at the repo depot. That's where they, they dump all the stiffs. And uh, we wound up in this, uh, with the uh, 392nd in Wendling. Wendling on the wash, they called it. It's, uh, it's just, I think it's south of London. Now this plane you flew over was the Colossal Fossil, you said? Was we flew over the Colossal Fossil, but then we got a new plane mm -hmm. and it was called Short Round. Mm -hmm. Was it painted or was it... Short Round, we had Short Round. Well, I mean, was your plane silver or was it painted, uh, the brown? No, we, we got, we got the, we flew, I think we flew one or two missions in a brown, not mm -hmm. our plane. Mm -hmm. And then we got, we got... Uh, we got our own. We got okay. our. Did you uh, do any other decoration on the nose except the, the no, name? No, we just put short rounds on it. Mm -hmm. Short rounds. Did you ever decorate your jackets? Uh... Oh yeah, I had. Yeah, I had. We had the jacket with the bombs on it and all that stuff. And and, and it, I, you know, I probably have it buried somewhere in a closet, and I, I can't. Don't even. Mm -hmm. I don't even know where the heck it is. Mm -hmm. But I, we. I, I had a. I had a gun collection of all sorts of stuff. I, I, when I. We, I got this charge from, uh, well, there's another story. Uh, I was amongst the early guys to get out, but before we got out, they, when we came back, they shoved me into the MPs back in South Dakota. And they, they put me with, they, I said, what the heck kind of nonsense is this? So they put me guarding the so-called gasoline at the other end, and I figured I'd, I'd, I'd sack up a little bit. And lo and behold, the CO try to play games with me you know they if you catch if they catch a guard sleeping they mm -hmm. they they reduce him in rank a court martial the whole bit and i'm left-handed so i had the gun on my left side and as as this guy came i see i have, I have a sixth sense and I, nobody was ever able to wake me because I, I i know when they and this guy was like i sort of saw this guy reaching to my right i pulled out the gun and put it right in his mouth <laughs> and I said I did 33 missions I said you've got a very nervous trigger finger I said back off and identify yourself he said, it was the CO <laughs> I, I never you know I, the, the, this guy was the guy that got the Congressional Medal of Honor for Ploesti and he fucked up he caused all those acts all those guys to get killed and they gave him a Congressional and they hushed it up and they made him they made him a hero I thought what the heck was his name again his name was Cain, Killer Cain. That's what they called him. The, uh, that's what the, that's what the guys. The, anybody that was on that mission with him, they called him Killer Cain. Because not because he was a hero, but because he killed. He caused guys to get killed. This is, you know, they, they'll hush it up and they'll say all kinds of things. But that's what happened. And then he said to me, I'll fix you, and he transferred me out. I wound up in uh, Tucson, Arizona. It was the best thing that could have happened to me. Um, was it? So you had uh, 33 missions. Can you tell us about some of the others? Or did your whole crew stay together for those whole yes. 33, except yes. for the guy you... One, the, the one mission where I, I, that, where I lost my... Uh, heated my heated suit, my oxygen. Oh, yes. uh, my heated suit shorted out, and I got frostbitten. I lost all the nails on my fingers and on my toes. But fortunately, we had a stand down, which means we didn't get any missions for two weeks. I didn't. I could have gone in and gotten the Purple Heart and had all that stuff. And, mm -hmm. But I, I treated myself because I, I didn't want I didn't want to lose my crew. So luckily for us, I had two weeks, of, and I and, and I we continued. Because once you get once you get uh, injured, you get reassigned, and I, I didn't want to leave my crew. Mm -hmm. Come hell or high water, that was we flew we flew all our missions together, which was unusual. In, in fact, we were like the senior crew, and we 
when the war was over, when it was all over, and the group broke up, we still had our own plane, and we flew some of the brass over. And we wound up in, uh, uh, in Connecticut. We landed in a field in Connecticut. Uh, what the heck was in there? Bradley Field in Connecticut. And we took the brass, and that was it. And that was the, you know... Do you keep in touch with those guys? I don't think they're all... I think they're all dead. I think I'm the only survivor. Mm -hmm. um, how... Did you have any missions, or many missions, where your plane was really uh, damaged heavily from flak, or...? Well, here's, there's, a, there's a very strange phenomenon. They issued us um, flak suits. <clears throat> Nobody ever wore a flak suit. We stood on them. Everybody protected their privates. That was the whole, I mean, that was the sole purpose of a flak suit, including the hat, the helmet. We put that, we put that right between, we put that, or whatever we could put between our legs and that helmet, we would press. Some of the guys used to put something, try to tape it around their privates. We came, we came back with, you know, everybody gets holes in their planes. We were, we were, from the third mission on, when we, when we crash landed that, that time, from that, I knew nothing was going to happen to us. It was like, like, a, like an omen from God. And uh, we were lucky. Everybody wanted to fly with us. Every, we, there was always ten men. Nine plus a, a Mickey man, or a, a Mickey man is, uh, these were radar guys, they, they anti-radar men. In the beginning, we used to throw out chaff. You know, when the kids were collecting silver mm -hmm. foil? Well, a silver foil threw off the German radar. Each piece of chaff uh, registered uh, as a plane. So they didn't know which was... But they, they kept them improving because the, the Germans, their, gun, their weapons were the best of all. They had better weaponry than what we had, much better. Their, their 88s were... Uh, in fact, we went to... They were so good that we went to a place called Halle. And uh, it's on the other side, on the eastern side. And as we're flying, all of a sudden, one plane goes down. And then see, it, it's a horrible. It's every time you see a plane going down, you feel it. You're a part of it. So the plane to my right goes down. The plane to my left goes down. The plane in front of me goes down. The plane, in, and and you say we're next positively. It was the flak. They had flak that looked as if a plane was going down. And and they and the and the they filled the, what they did with the weaponry as they were beginning to lose their um, ammunition, whatever it is, they began using improvising. So in, instead of using pellets, the ball bearings and stuff like that, uh, the temperature on these things incidentally ran, ran about 2,000 degrees. So if a f piece of flak would go into your ship and hit you, it would go right through your hand and go through your bone. It would. It would. It was that hot. I mean, it was. It was unbelievable. It was like uh, somebody working in a steel mill in a piece of the red hot. That's how hot it was. Thousands, uh, two thousand degrees. It would. It was. It would melt you. Anyway, uh, many a guy got killed just by a little little pellet went through the head. If it hit him in the head, right through the head, go right through. Uh, anyway, so they were beginning to use letters from linotype, those little letters that they put in type. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the missions we we got hit, you know, got holes all over them, and all of a sudden we hit one, ping, and it winds up in the top turret and embeds itself in the top turret, and the letter was A, and my engineer's name was Acock, <laughs> and I said to him, Charlie, that was for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, who, who were these Mickey men? I, I a Mickey I man remember. is an anti-radar. They have a radar, uh, some kind of a, a unit that sends out signal to counteract the German radar. They call we call them Mickey. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what the what the real it's, it was. The, mm -hmm. It was probably M I C something, etc. Some kind of radar jamming device. Yeah, evidently. that's what it was. So every so every uh, usually they, a crew would have there would be nine guys on a crew, and on a mission they would take a one Mickey man on. Especially we were, we were pl in the uh, in the in, towards the end we were we were deputy deputy lead we were flying behind the lead and that, if any he got hit we would take over and that's we were lucky we were a lucky crew the, we're probably the luckiest crew around but uh, we we saw it all we saw it all there was one mission 
on a tw uh, the, one of the guys, they, they finished their, uh, it was at that time, it was like 30 missions. They had finished their, it was, they came back for their last mission, and they took the, the uh, you know, the, what do you call it, gun that shoots up the flares, the flare gun, mm -hmm. and they fired, and it, it, it didn't go through the plane, it stayed in the plane. And the plane caught fire and blew up yeah. on their last mission, just over the base, just over the base, so they, they, they no, no flare guns. No flare guns were to be used unless in an absolute emergency. When they, uh, when they would shoot flares, the plane, let's put it this way, if they were wounded aboard, they'd fire a red flare. That would mean, that would give us the, that plane priority to make the landing first mm -hmm. because some of the wounds were, they had to be treated immediately. Mm -hmm. If they fired a green flare, that meant there was structural damage so that the, the uh, trucks and all that stuff were ready in case the plane blew up on the, on the ground when it made the land. So that, but, but the reds got priority, the wounded. And if there was a, if there was a um, let's say the mission was scrubbed, they would fire a, a red flare. That would mean the mission was scrubbed, and they would announce Almogordo. Almogordo was where my group assembled, and that was like the code word, no mission. And that's how they would do it. We would go into a, it's a very strange story. We'd go into, for a mission, they'd get you up like 3 o'clock in the morning, and you'd go in, you'd have breakfast. Non-coms had, we had the best breakfast. We ate, I mean... You name it, we had it. Breakfast would consist of steak and eggs. I mean, they really, the ground pounders used to try to come into our mess hall. Ground pounders are those that didn't fly. We call them ground pounders. And um, after we'd have a very hearty meal, we'd go for briefing. Now, they'd have this map on the wall, which would be covered. But we knew where we were going to go before they even unrolled the map. If there were three chaplains there, you were going to go to one of the B's. There were three B's. Big B, Middle B, and Little B. Big B was Berlin. Middle B was Bremen. And Little B was Brunswick. Brunswick was the steelworks. Bremen was the port. And Big B was Berlin, which was the hottest target of them all. In fact, in some of these hot targets, the Germans put railroad guns. What they did... You have an 88 millimeter, the 88 cannon. Okay, that gun was the equivalent on a Navy ship of a, oh, we'll say a 8 inch gun, 10 inch gun. But they used to put on the railroad, they put the equivalent of 16 inch guns. They put, they were stationed, they were, they were so powerful that the, the train itself had a special extra weight. So that, and when they fired those guns, the sky, they would cover the sky. It was the most awesome thing you ever saw. We got hit by them once. And, and it was, it was we, we couldn't wait. I was looking for fighters. I was praying fighters because when the fighters come, the flak stops. And uh, I, I, that was probably one of the scariest experiences of my life when, when they fired those railroad guns. They were awesome. They were awesome. I mean, visualize a 16-inch gun firing straight up. What it carried, they, they carried, they carried like over a thousand pounds of of, 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 you name it, whatever you want to call it, white hot, through the sky, and you know people say you know when it, if it touches you, it burns, it burns you. If you get hit in the finger, it'll take a piece of that that part of the finger, it'll take it off. If you get hit in the elbow, that bullet goes right through your bone. It's awesome. And these, and they visualized, these were millions and millions of pellets and, 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 ugh, unreal. But that's the way it was. But we were lucky. We were a lucky crew. I know. Were, mo were most of your ra raids into Germany or, uh, did you I think I had France one, I had one raid, in, one raid in France. Most of, it was all in Germany. When I see a map of Germany, <laughs> I can pick, and I, here's the ironic, this is very funny. My daughter worked for a company, and she went to Ber uh, to not to Berlin, to Hamburg. And <laughs> she she says to the guy, she says, "The very strange world." She says, "My my my father bombed this place." <laughs> my son, uh, Monday, he went to Frankfurt and Düsseldorf. I said, "I bombed both places." <laughs>
Um, did you, uh, when you came back, did you join any veterans groups, or have you joined? Any I joined veterans? the Jewish War Veterans, and uh, then I have the, the Eighth Air Force Society, and the, and the uh, whatever else there was. I joined just about all of them. I have just one card. Do you ever go to any of the reunions? Oh yeah, we went to. I went to. They honored the. Second, the let's see, the 14th Combat Wing, which was part, that's the overall uh, in uh, Norwich, in England. And a lot of the B-24s were based there. They built a library, a magnificent library. That library has one section is devoted to our group. The CEO of that 14th Combat Wing was a guy you all know, Jimmy Stewart. Now, Jimmy Stewart was probably the finest uh, representative of Hollywood. He never shunned a mission. Not like Clark Gable, they gave him milk runs, they gave him, but I'm speaking about, this guy went to Berlin, this guy, ne he was a gentleman, he was the nicest guy. Did you ever meet him? Yeah, I met him. Uh, we had, uh, so that anyway, they, they had, as we were driving through this town, they took us, we went back to our base, and our, my base is now a turkey farm. And they had these kids jumping out of the cars, Yanks, God bless you. And, and then we had one man, uh, the, he said, the, the, the Jerry's blew up our home, and the Yanks took my, me and my family, they put us, they billeted us, and they fed us, and he says, I owe my life to the Yanks. And, and, and everyone there, long, I know, this was 60 years later, and it was such a feeling. I mean, we, we, we were treated as if we were royalty. We went to, then we went to this huge cathedral, and, and then the, 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 all the, the big shots blessed the whole, the Eighth Air Force. And the, it, was, it was awesome. It was awesome. We had banquets and this and that. It was remarkable. What's that card you got there? This was, this was the Historical Society. Well, if you hold it up toward the yeah. camera, he'll be able to get that. That's the... In in um, in Georgia, that's where it all originated. In um, let's see, what the heck? Let me just see. Hold on. Okay, it was, I got it. Uh, uh, now, what's what city in Georgia? Uh, you know, so many have told us in the last two days. That I think we would remember. Uh, Atlanta. No, no, no another one. Uh, I know someone said Atlanta. I knew it wasn't. It wasn't Atlanta. Atlanta. It's a sh. Yeah. Um, Savannah area. No, no, no. Uh, Savannah. Savannah. It was Savannah. They, they built this museum. In fact, my name is one of the names there. Uh, it's it's a magnificent, and they've they've done something that no other place has done. You go into a room, and they have exactly what a bombing raid consisted of. And you feel as if you're part of it. You hear the machine guns going off. You hear the flak. You hear the every, it, it, it's it's as if you're on a mission. And people walk out of that room all oh, white. You know what I mean? And that, that's and then there's then I belong to the uh, let's see another another group I belong to. I've I've, I've gone to a number of reunions. What squadron was it that you were in, did you say? The 577th Bomb Squadron, 392nd Bomb Group yes. in Wendling. Do you have any uh, photographs of yourself uh, in I, uniform? I or? have a, yeah, I have. I have a picture. <laughs> I, was, I have a picture sitting on a 4,000-pound bomb. <laughs> now, there's another funny story. When we first went into BASIC, you know, I went into the Air Force, uh, there was a guy named Earhart. He came from Antler, Oklahoma. He was a real country hick. I, I don't mean country hick by the say. I mean, when I say country hick, I said to him, you know, Earhart, they, I, first of all, I saw this guy pick up a 500-pound bomb just like this. He's the kind of guy when somebody asked him direction, he'd pick up the plow and point. <laughs> anyway, I said to him, Earhart, they, they worked, they, do you know that they, they wrote a song about your state, Oklahoma? And he says, you funnin' me. I said, you big moron. I said, it goes like this. 
Oklahoma, where the sun goes sweep. You know what he did? He picked me up and threatened to throw me in the ground. He says, "You fun in my state." And I yelled to one of the one of the fellows from New York. I said, "Will you please sing me Oklahoma before I get killed?" And they start singing it. And he says, "You weren't fun in me." I said, "No, you dumb oaky son of a bitch. He put me down." <laughs> You could call him any name, but don't make fun of his state. <laughs> Did you um, ever make use of the GI Bill? Um, yeah, well, I, I went to that, uh, when I went to uh, Pace, uh -huh. I, I used that. Uh -huh. How about the 5220 Club? Did you ever use that at all? Very little. Uh -huh. I did very little on that. I, I should have used it all because it was wonderful for, for, uh, for mortgages and stuff. Uh -huh. Wow, it did some job. Uh, what was it like when President Roosevelt died? How, how did you all feel? It's a very strange way I got. I heard it. Uh, we turned on Axis, not Axis Sally, the other one, uh, Lord A. Mm -hmm. Achtung, Achtung, the President von the United States is tot. That's what it. That's what I. I was. I translated. I said, "Hey, there's Nazi bastards." I said, "They said the president of the United States is dead." I said, "Boy, what what stupid propaganda that was!" Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, it was true. You know, that's the we we were. Oh, boy, we were really peeled. We really could not. There's another story that you would appreciate. When guys got shot down, they would pray that the German soldiers would grab them because the civilians would come at them with pick forks, pitchforks, mm -hmm. and they'd, cut, they'd, they'd tear them to pieces. With the, they'd, just, they'd just chop them up. There's a town in Hanau in Germany where the British uh, would bomb. They bombed the place and they got shot down. And two planes, there were like I don't know, 12, 12 people, they were alive and, and they were attacked by the German civilians and they they chopped them to pieces with their pitchforks. And on every bombing mission that was in the area, they always saved the bomb for Hannah, the British. They always made sure that they drop, they, would, they wouldn't drop the full load. They, from that point on, the British always dropped one extra bomb on Hannah. It's amazing. Isn't that a story? Were you involved in the, any of the daylight raids into Berlin? I didn't go to Berlin. That was I was. Oh, okay. Thank God, I didn't hit Berlin. Mm -hmm. I, after after the war, we flew. We we ferried. You know the ground people. We took them, but we, we didn't go to Berlin. We took them around Berlin and flew around Berlin. There's a. I'll tell you a funny story. There was a whack. Uh, she was the Air Force, whatever it was. Uh, she was a major. She's a bitch. She was so so uniform happy in in combat crews. The rank didn't mean anything. The pilot was the boss, but it was, we were a very close knit. It was like one unit. And this bitch, she would walk by and make you salute and all that nonsense. Anyway, we took her on this. Now we had a relief tube on the plane, which was a funnel mm -hmm. with a rubber hose. And if you had, it was very seldom that you could go because you would do all the clothes. You had you wore shorts. Long johns, then you wore uh, uh, what do you call it, a uh, flight suit, then you wore a heated suit, and then you wore a leather suit over that, a, a, a lamb, lamb's wool suit. So you, the temperatures, by the way, were as high as minus 60. It was so cold. In the beginning, a lot of guys died from suffocation because their oxygen masks clogged up from their water vapor, from their breathing. So in the beginning, we found a way to stop it. We cut the tips of condoms and put it over, and it stopped it. And in the beginning, the Air Force used more condoms than the entire armed services put together. And they thought we were a bunch of sex fiends. <laughs> but <laughs> it was for our own for safety, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So tell us her story about her. <clears throat> oh, so anyway, <laughs> so she so she goes on on this trip, and I hated that bitch. And I said to Dale, Dale, when I go, uh -huh, you just say Roger. So she says, she starts asking, what's this, what's this? She comes to the, and she says, what's this? I says, oh, that's special communication for the pilot. 
in case of emergency. So she says, can I try this? She says, go ahead. And I go, Ahem. she has the headsets on, and Dale goes, Roger, Roger. And she says, it smells funny. <laughs> well, everybody knew about it, and the rumor spread. Well, they called her, but they called her by proxy. You know, I have to tell you, she, she was ready to kill me. She found out what happened. She was ready to kill me. <laughs> Okay, um, I don't know if you had any other... What else you? else? Or? I guess you've told some great oh, stories. Oh, uh, what was your reaction when you heard about the atomic oh, yes. bombs being dropped? I would say, I said it was about time. Because, I mean, we, we dropped bombs, we, it was, it was amazing. In, in the beginning they were using the bomb sites. But then, as we got more and more planes together, we began using the lead plane would drop the bomb, and, and then we we drop on the lead plane. Uh, in some instances, the lead bomb would drop on the, and in, in one instance, a B-17 got his tail bombed off, and but he made it. It's amazing that guy made it. Sometimes a wing would get hit. Uh, we lost. I wouldn't exaggerate if I tell you we lost at least 200 planes just formation flying. We had green pilots. And, and, and the tighter the formation, the more central fire. And, and it, it was, you know, you, you have wind, you have all kinds, you know, you're flying, you're flying for four hours this way, close. It's one little, one little, so they used to practice before they do it. Was, uh, one of the most scary things I ever had was my co-pilot. The co-pilots were not very good. So my co-pilot couldn't land the plane worth a damn. We, and, I, and, and on every on every mission, a radio operator and a and a uh, engineer had to go. Flight engineer had to go. My pilot, my co-pilot, was so bad that my pilot shot landings with him. Can you visualize ten landings with a sloppy pilot like that? He would come in high and he'd zoom in. And he'd come in low and be scared that we thought we were going to get hit. Uh, it was the it was the scariest thing until after the tenth landing. The pilot said, "The hell with it." He says, "I'll do it myself." <laughs> but he taught all of us how to fly. Not to, he taught us how to slow down the engines, how to in case of an emergency to at least to crash land the plane whichever way we could. But that's what we we learn. He, he was a he was a super pilot. He was absolutely. Uh, I, when I think of him, he was just marvelous. He should he was the kind of guy that should have been a general, but he liked the source too much. And he was a retrobate. He was. <laughs> he was. Tell us the story on camera. The uh, what he he's the one that uh, was set that? up the the chaplain. Yeah, <laughs> we had a chaplain. <clears throat> who had a master's degree in Hebrew. He says, I wanted to learn it from the source. And he was the sweetest guy you ever want to meet. But he liked, he liked the source. And my pilot was a, a real retrobate. And he hired one of the local town prostitutes to climb into bed with this father. The father was, uh, he was a little high. And he went, to, plopped him into bed. And in comes this prostitute. And she jumps into bed. And she strips naked. He opens his eyes, takes one look at her, and his reaction was unbelievable. I forgive you, my child, and he gives her his blessing, and he jumps right out of bed and walks out of the room. <laughs> um, when did you, uh, when were you discharged? You didn't write that on your <clears throat> discharged. I was discharged <clears throat> September, I think September 25th, 1945. And, and when I came home, uh, everybody had such long faces. Uh, my uncle was discharged two weeks before me, and when he went to get a bus, he got run over and killed. Oh, after God. he, so. Oh. Do, were you ever? I, I don't know if we've asked this of, of many in the Air Force. Were you aware of concentration camps and their existence? Or? Oh sure. Well, in fact, we we were. We were hoping to bomb these bastards. My, I, I had friends of mine that were um, in PWs and saw the, what was going on. They were in, and and oh, there's another story that would be very interesting. One of my friends uh, was in the concentration camp, and they, they moved them. As the American troops were moving in, mm -hmm. they would move them further, and they'd walk them 
they'd make them walk. And one of the guards had a had a wore in his sh in his shoe. He had a spike that stuck out. And if anybody slowed down, he'd kick him, and it would make a penetrating wound. Many a guy got crippled on account of that. And they were in Nuremberg, and all of a sudden they hear a lot of noise, and they all run to the to the bathroom where, where they they dug in or whatever it is. And who who pulls up? Lo and behold, Patton. He lines them up and he says, "Which one of these sons of a bitch has mistreated you?" And they all pointed to that guard with the spike. They take the guard around the back of the place. Bang, bang. Patton did his own killing. Really? Patton I've never knocked, heard that story. Patton before. knocked him off. He didn't. He was. He was one uh, one tough guy. But that's what happened. Patton did it. Did you ever go to the, uh, I guess, one of the last things, USO shows, or? That's where I saw Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first thing they had. A, That's they how gave, you learn the song, uh, right? I, I saw Oklahoma twice. I saw it in 19, 1943 and in 19, now in, 19, in 20, 2002, 20, 2002. <laughs> the, the first version was better. It was cheaper. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much. Yes, that was a great you. interview. Thank you. And um, probably within two months you'll receive a copy of the tape. Wonderful. Um,